डॉक्टर डी वी गुंडप्पा हिज लाइफ एंड अचीवमेंट्स मैन ऑफ लेटर्स और ऑफ टू टाइप्स देर आर दोज हु फुलफिल दमसेल्फ सोली और मेनली इन क्रिएटिव राइटिंग देर आर दोज हुज लिटरी वर्क और जस्ट सम ऑफ द रेस रेडिएटिंग फ्रॉम ए सेंट्रल फ्लेम दीज आर एसेंशियली मैन हु आर इन्वॉल्व इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ पर्पजफुल लिविंग मैन ऑफ एंड डीवर ऑन एक्शन एंड द राइटिंग इज अ फॉर्म ऑफ एक्शन दे आर बिगो वेरी मच बिगर दैन द सम टोटल ऑफ देर राइटिंग्स they are architects shaping their lives and writing is a means to an end the great man to whose memory we are paying a tribute today belongs to this category poet critic biographer and master of prose the president of the 18th kannada literary conference dvg was also a member of the mysore legislative council a member of the mysore political reforms committee the first president of the mysore state journalist association and the president of the first all karnataka journalist conference when saram vishweshwaraya was elected president of the south india people's conference in 1929 he insisted that dvg should be his secretary not because he was an eminent man of letters but because he was a knowledgeable writer on political issues a man of unimpeachable integrity a man who could think clearly and express himself with precision and without uh, rhetoric and a man who could work in a team This translator of Shakespeare and Omar Khayyam was also the author of The State and Their People in the Indian Constitution and The Case of the People of the Indian States. He gave the Kannada readers a unique poem Mankutimana Kagga. He gave the people of Karnataka a unique institution, the Gokule Institute of Public Affairs. To make the world a better place to live in this expression has become a cliche but to DVG this was the sole justification of life he once made a startling statement all that I have done these 60 years is to be a journalist all that I have written be it on politics or philosophy be it literature or music be it in prose or verse all that I have done be it in the legislative council or elsewhere in the public life is just journalism in one form or another but what was journalism to him he conceived its mission loftily as a policeman keeps awake the whole night in order that citizens might sleep in peace as the soldier stands firm on the battlefield that his countrymen might live in security the journalist has to shed all thought of comfort and has to toil so that all people may live happily he was a creative writer but also a responsible citizen and a sentinel Dr Gundappa was born in Mulbagal some 60 miles from Bangalore in Kolar district he came from an orthodox family not too fortunate in worldly matters he could not pass a secondary school leaving examination married at the age of 16 or 17 he tried his hand at a number of prof- professions as a teacher a company agent a vendor of stamp papers and so on For a time he found refuge as a clerk in a factory for painting jatkas that is carriages drawn by horses the salary was 10 rupees a month but even this haven't he lost after four months but fortunately his work here had brought him into contact with journalism and he now became a journalist i do not propose to narrate in detail the story of his life although the temptation is strong After a brief spell in Madras he settled in Bangalore his articles brought him to the notice of Sir M Vishweshwaraya then the Diwan or Chief Minister of Mysore state DVG's fort right views expressed in his own English biweekly the Karnataka displeased even his friend Sir M V DVG grew interested in the country's affairs his writings drew the attention of men like honorable Srinivasa Shastri and he became more and more involved in public life and discussions He began with an admiration for British rule but soon grew disillusioned. He was a great disciple of Gopala Krishna Gokhale who epitomized for him the ideal citizen, a man of integrity, of independent thought and sober action. He was like his master, a liberal. He believed in equipping himself for any task he undertook. The government nominated him to the Bangalore municipality and then to the state legislative council. He was also a member of the Mysore University Senate and its council. This man who had never stepped into a college as a student. Later the university honored itself by conferring the Doctor of Letters degree on him. In 1969 he received the Sahitya Akademi award for his Srimad Bhagavad Gita Tatparya Athwa Jeevan Dharma Yoga. 
incidentally his son dr b g l swami received the sahitya academy award in 1978 for his hasiru honnu as the passing years made the inevitability of the dawn of independence clear dvg felt that the youth of the country should be trained for the responsibilities of freedom the struggle for freedom demanded heroism freedom itself demanded wisdom with the young men who clustered around him he discussed the problems of a free india he stressed responsible citizenship once when i was with him a bunch of young men came to complain that water supply to their locality was irregular and inadequate they wished to complain to the authorities he said have you ascertained how much water other parts of the city are getting if an officer asks you how many houses there are on a particular road in your locality and how many street taps are there can you answer him it was this man who founded the gokule institute and its work filled quite a considerable part of his life thereafter dvg's work brought him into the contact with eminent men like sri v s srinivasa shastri p s shivaswami ayer and t r venkatarama shastri and powerful diwans of mysore state like sir m v and sir mirza ismail he won their friendship and regard but he never was affluent at he declined all offers of government employment he often assisted saram v and vishweshwarya was not a man to accept free service he sent checks dvg protested saram v insisted so dvg accepted the checks but never encashed them indeed it was not in his nature to encash any service he had rendered from those who knew him intimately We have it on record that for years his wife would not visit neighbors because she didn't have a decent sari to wear. Some of the letters which passed between DVG and his son BGL Swami has been published recently. They show both how DVG was in financial straits and how he struggled not to be the burden to his son. In one letter he writes, "You know the maintenance of this chatram called our family depends on your check." in all seriousness i would ask you to look on this monthly expenditure of yours as an act of dharma it is no pleasure to be such a drain on your funds I have been thinking of a way of managing without being a burden upon you i must soon find a way but how soon i shall succeed i cannot say i await the mercy of god and at when his fellow citizens presented him with a purse of a lakh of rupees he made over the entire amount to the gokule institute even the 5000 rupees he got with the sahitya academy award went to the institute dvg was probably never totally free from financial worry but he was always a cordial host and a genial man in later years he became an institution and a servant and had visitors from all the walks of life men of letters sometimes from other parts of the country sanskrit scholars of repute and teenagers from colleges a batch of young men and women from gujarat or from germany journalists from mysore or madhya pradesh he never knew who might call on him the interpretation of a verse from a rigveda or from shakespeare the ethics of journalism or the proprietary of the utterance of a leader and the beauty of a couplet in kalidasa or of a song composed by vasudeva acharya values in education are a delicacy which was popular 50 years ago you might find any subject under the sun being discussed in this room when you walked in and the most serious discussion of the most obscure subject would be punctuated with loud laughter often provoked by the old man's own commands he could laugh at others and he could laugh at himself the man made one feel anger even at 85 he remained ang and his enthusiasm was infectious he was not a revolutionary his speeches were not thrilling but one felt one was in presence not of a rich man but of a rich personality his words came from a mind irrigated by the twin streams of knowledge and experience and he was rich in the friendships he had acquired and the respect and affection he commanded the lad who had been unable to pass the sslc examination had come a long way and whatever he had he earned by hard work to give a simple instance there was his english i often wonder at his command of english even in conversation he chose the right words and used them with such precision 
he had mastered a foreign language by sheer effort he ha- had the hallmark of a true scholar a devotion to the precision i think his philosophy can be summed up in two statements he made himself once someone said to him all the world praises mr so and so just go to his house now and see what's going on dvg's answer was why should i take upon myself god's work it's for good to it's for god to judge let each man find comfort where he will it is not for me to judge and then speaking about a certain dr achita rao he says he believed that god had made honey and given man lips in order that man can bring honey and lips together apart from making life a continuous process of enrichment what did dvg achieve there is of course the gokule institute a visible symbol of a sense of civic responsibility and a tribute to one man's vision he was averse to all recognition when a periodical published a laudatory article on him he wrote such praise of a living man is ill advised as as long as he was alive he would not permit the city corporation to name the road where he lived after him and yet he agreed to a public felicitation i think the only reason was that it would bring a purse of a lakh of rupees which he could donate to the institute today it has a library of more than 80000 volumes and these included some rare classics it is one of the centers of the cultural activities in bangalore It is not for me to assess DVG's works as a legislator or his political thought but I must mention his contribution to Kannada through the Kannada Sahitya Parishad the Yuva Raja was the president but the vice president was really in charge of the institution those were the days when parishad had but meager funds and it has vice president dvg added new dimension to its work i wish to mention just two schemes in a country where the overwhelming majority were illiterate he saw the gamaki a man who could render poetry effectively as a link between a poet and a reader he started training classes in gamaka the gamakis were trained to render not only the classics but modern poems Secondly he organized the Vasanta Sahitya Utsava in a highly imaginative way he realized that sooner or later the language of the people had to be the language of instruction he invited professors of the university to speak in Kannada on the subjects of their specialization and got teachers from all over the state to attend spectacled professors and diffident professors were soon look, looking for technical equivalents in Kannada DVG is one of the Navodaya that is renaissance writers these writers form the bridge between the literature of the pre-modern age and the literature of the modern age from the west ideas books and challenges came flooding the mind these writers had like ishwara arresting the devastating onrush of ganga to arrest this flood and to ensure that they and their generation were not swept off their feet they were stepped in classical sanskrit and kannada in literatures and indian philosophy he is to be credited of this generation that it absorbed the shock and shaped a new and forward looking literature without sacrificing into inheritance dvg belonged to this generation so far as i know the first serious discussion of the nature and the role of literature in the navodaya age was in a talk given by dvg in september 1920 the talk was subsequently published with the title sahitya mattu janajeevana the first observation he makes is this most kannada poets sustain themselves in borrowing from sanskrit contemporary poets have little knowledge of the world they live in therefore says dvg if a man should say if i don't know sanskrit i lose something if i don't know english i lose something but what do i lose if i don't know kannada we have no answer dvg insists on the contemporary relevance of literature and on the close relationship between the literature of an age and the social environment in which it takes shape to quote him where the life of the people moves vigorously towards many goals purposeful and meaningful writing will appear but where the life of the people is built of heroism and magnanimity where the people are immersed in mere sordid toil great poetry cannot be born and of the language he says this is a lesson kannadigas will do well to remember the more precise our understanding of our political and economic duties the more earnest the implementation of them the better and stronger our language becomes 
Even more interestingly, he asserts that the same inspiration shaped the founding of the Indian National Congress, the vision of Sir M. V., which led to the construction of the Krishna Raja Sagara Dam, the research of Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, and the poetry of the Ravindranath Tagore. The process of the nativization of the Western poetics is at work here. The mind moves freely from Ananda Vardhana to Gilbert Murray, and examples are drawn from Kalidasa and Shakespeare. DVG quotes the Sanskrit verse. Niyamakriti Niyatirahitam, etc., and they immediately adds, This is the view of the Western writers on poetics, too. Referring to the Renaissance age of daring act and adventurous thought, the age from which Shakespeare emerged, DVG reflects, such must have been the age of Vyasa also. Speaking of creative writing, he observes, If poetry is to be sweet to the lips and ears of the reader, its languages must be graceful. If it is not to appeal to its intellect, it must have weight of content. If this is to be achieved, poetry needs the discipline of the Indian poet and the unfettered thought of the English poet. Beyond his exposition of the power of the poetry or the well-known Indian concept of Kanta Samhiti and Shelley's assertion that the imagination is at the root of all morality. Since separate papers are being presented on the creative and critical writing of DVG, I shall not be so presumptuous as to attempt a detailed study of either, but for the sake of the completeness, I shall take the liberty of offering some observations. DVG's reaction to the Western influence as a creative writer is also one of the rewarding assimilation. The biography was one of the forms which came to Canada at the time of its renaissance. DVG has given us some excellent biographies. A study of an early collection of his poems like Nivedana, published in 1924, is interesting. The lyric came to Canada from English literature, except for the devotional outbringing of the Vachanakaras and the Haridasas. The pioneers who are faced with the task of finding the right meters and diction for the new form and spirit. Here is a young poet flexing his literary muscles as it were. The meters he chose are indigenous meters like the Sisa, the Kanda and the Shatpadi. But the spirit is modern. I would particularly refer to the poem Beluri na Shila Balakiyaru. It is an odd address to the lovely nymphs who adorn the brackets in the Shanyakeshwara temple in Belur. The stanzas are regular in the sense that the meters are clearly defined and recognized like the Kanda and the Rutta, but all the stanzas do not employ the same meter. Though the meters are native Kannada meters, the total form, the odd itself, is the gift of English poetry. The, poet, the poem is reminiscent of Keats Ode on a Grecian urn. It contains the Kannada rendering of a line from Keats' ode, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. It glances at the famous words, Beauty is truth, truth is beauty. But more important than this technical experimentation and Kitsian influence is the spirit of the poem. The temple is conceived as the mansion of a bewitching beauty in love with the Vishwashilpi procla proclaiming the mantra of Sarasa Jeevana or a life of aesthetic joy. God is neither power nor justice, not even mercy here. He is the supreme lover, the fountain of joy. It is a distinctly individual response to life, but not didactic but moral in the best sense, in the sense that it recognizes the enrichment of life as the highest worship. The word often used to describe DVG is Dimanta. The epithet finds full justification in a poem like Mankuti Manakaga. It has proved to be one of the most popular poems in the language and in the course of 44 years has seen 8 editions. The poem as a frame, also the opening verses capture the vision of a vast universe in which millions of lives are engaged in a frenzied dance, a universe of awesome clashes and invasions, a universe of balls of fire and of terrifying abysses. The questions are asked, what is the goal of man inhabiting such an universe? What is his worth, his end? What is the meaning of it all? It seems to me that the rest of the poem is to be read in Till's context of a sentient and intelligent being in an immense universe in which inscrutable forces are at work. In every section, the speaker viewer shifts his point of view, but informing the entire poem is a central vision of the meaningfulness of life. Even when viewed in frame of a vastness of the universe and the immensity of time, 
again and again the reader feels as if a button has been pressed and a light flashes forth the best part of the poem achieve a balance of thought and a feeling a balance to use a cliche of the head and the heart a few words about another important work and i have done this is the eighth volume eighth volume gnapaka chitra shale this was a work of his later years in fact the last volume was a posthumous publication the work can be viewed from several angles as reminiscences a cultural history or as a gallery of portraits as sparkling and thoughtful prose here is an elderly man of letters his mind stepped in indian thought and literature writing with a sheer delight in the wealth and variety of human nature which reminds one of the shakespeare of the comedies of ben johnson of goldsmith and jane austen and dickens and bernard shaw the vitality the enduring strength of the people manifests here in hundred forms in people of all castes and social levels DVG is aware of how much of injustice, cruelty and stupidity there in life but his eyes are fixed on the goodness and culture of people. Charity and magnanimity characterize the recreation of this teeming world and at the end of it all he helps us retain our faith in and respect for man. It is a vision to ripeness which makes life worth living of inner strength which makes life bearable. It is a brave vision for which one is grateful to DVG. Certain aspects of DVG's writings might strike a later day readers as limitations. Thus, in his recorded response to life, it seems to me that he doesn't reckon with evil. Not that he was unaware of its presence or its power, but in his vision of flowering of the spirit, the withering power of evil doesn't receive the attention it thought to. In fact, it seems to me that this is the limitation of the most of the writers of his generation. Secondly, the vision focuses on the ripeness of the individual spirit, but the society it takes for granted is a static society, and it seems to me the problem of the social change is clearly recognized. But despite these limitations, DVG's legacy is a great legacy. We may repeat what Dryden said of Chaucer: "Here is God's plenty." This is a letter written by L.S. Sheshakiri Rao, often referred to as L.S.S., who is an Indian writer and an academic specializing in Kannada literature. He wrote an English Kannada dictionary that is a standard reference text for lakhs of students. The birth centenary of Dr. D.V. Gundappa, eminent literator, savant, a polyglot, a great patriot, a prominent social worker and founder of the Gokule Institute of Public Affairs was celebrated under the joint auspices of the Sahitya Academy Delhi and the government of Karnataka at Bangalore on August 29, 1987. It was inaugurated by Sri Ramakrishna Hegde, Chief Minister of Karnataka. A seminar was organized on the 30th and 31st when eminent men of letters read papers on different aspects of DVG. And the letter which we just heard is written by Professor L.S. Sheshigiri Rao and is being produced here for, here for the benefit of the readers. No copyright infringement intended. Thank you.